Welcome, church family. If uh, you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. Uh, I'm the lead pastor, and I have the privilege to be on the preaching team. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. Uh, we'll be in Luke chapter 1, 26 through 56. Uh, we do have a few announcements, uh, more announcements before we jump into the text. One, I'm, I'm going to make it a little awkward for some who don't want attention, but if you have volunteered in TDC Kids over the past three years, so the past three years, would you stand right now? So it's just, someone's going to have to do it, then everyone's going to pop up who's done it. So if you have a blue shirt on, we know, we know that's you. And then, oh, no, no, keep standing. No, no, come on, Luke, we need you up. I'm not done talking. If you, hey, last three years, if you've seriously helped out in TC Kids, uh, please stand up. Uh, I know it's a little awkward, but th- these men and women have given their time to disciple kids these past three years. And what we've seen is uh, we've taken all of our kids through the Bible uh, this past three years. And they've learned that every scripture is about Jesus Christ, the glories of Christ. And, and by God's grace, we believe the Spirit of God is not only hiding it in their, uh, in their mind, but also their heart is going to change them. Those are seeds. And I just want to say thank you uh, on behalf of all, you know, Jonathan, myself, the pastors. And so we'll give a round of applause for these men and women. Thank you. Um, it is such a privilege <laughs> to, to get to share Christ with these kids because really, uh, the only thing that, that really matters in life, or what, what matters in life most, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and your investment allows these kids to know the life, the only true life that's in, in Christ. Uh, and so thank you. And uh, we always have a lot of kids. And so it is a worthy investment. If you're not serving TC Kids, we always, always are in need of TC Kids. There's never a, a shortage of, of that. And so, um, man, please consider serving there. It is... Um, it's such an it's a, such a important ministry. Uh, second thing is we have Christmas Eve gatherings coming up. Uh, on the 23rd, we are having a Christmas Eve gathering that's mirror the 24th. Uh, so if you prefer that, Saturday, uh, we'll have a, candle, a candlelight evening uh, at 5 p.m. Then also on Sunday, we're trying to make everyone happy, which, you know, when you try to make everyone happy, you make, you make no one happy. So don't email me. What I'll say is we're having a morning gathering, two morning gatherings, and then an afternoon gathering. Hopefully that will fit one of your schedules uh, for all your family gatherings. And we're super excited to gather this Christmas Eve and celebrate the birth of Christ. Uh, we want you to know it. Invite friends, your family, your neighbors. Uh, it'll be very, very clear gospel message presented. Uh, we'd love to have you join us this Christmas Eve. All right, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 56. We are continue on in our sermon series, All Saints Now Celebrate. We release a album uh, a Christmas album that is titled All Saints Now Celebrate. What I like about it, one, it's a command. Uh, that, that statement, all saints now celebrate. If you are in Christ, you, you've become a sinner to a son, a saint, uh, by the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. And you should, uh, you should celebrate. It's a command. Why? Because now your position has changed from a sinner to a son. So it's a command that leads our, our minds. This is what we should be doing this Advent Christmas se- season. And also, all saints now celebrate. It's an invitation. What are you celebrating this Christmas season? Where is your heart set on? And so it's an invitation to reorient your hearts to the beauties and the realities of Christ and the invitation to celebrate the only thing that is really worthy of, of our full affection. And so uh, I love our, our sermon series title for Advent. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at the text. Uh, it's the Magnificat, Mary's song, and, and how she rejoices to the news that she'll be bearing uh, God's son, uh, the sermon title is Celebrate Your Low Estate. So if you're keeping notes, celebrate uh, your low estate. Now, this Christmas season, there's lots going on. I feel like December is the busiest. Uh, if I mean, I'm just, it's, it's a lot. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, maybe I'm just I'm being uh, just, you know, verb- verbally processing right now. It's a lot. I mean, you got end of the year business stuff going on. You have Christmas parties. You got to get, you know, the, the Christmas presents. You're trying to figure out how you're going to do that with all the finances. It's just, and everyone wants you, I mean, it's just a lot. And so uh, I think we can just be off track a lot of times for Christmas. Uh, and so I'm so grateful you're here to hopefully to, to re, again, reorient. What, what are we doing here uh, in this season? Uh, songs, I, I believe, can take us off track. And I'm not, I'm not against Christmas songs. They're just interesting. I get the little kids singing. I just wrote down a few songs. You got Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. You know, that's, that's a fun one that the kids sing. Really nothing to do with Christmas, but it's a fun one to sing. Uh, then you have 
you know, here comes Santa Claus again, nothing to do with the Christmas. So you, as you talk to kids, like, well, this is confusing. Like, what, what are we celebrating here? Uh, there's a few Christmas songs. We're going to get Mary's song here in a second. <laughs> Completely different type of song. Uh, we got chestnuts uh, roasting on the open fire. That's a different one. That's more of comfort, and relax. Uh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Again, all these songs are very nostalgic, comfort, maybe consumeristic in nature, but totally missing what Christmas is all about. If you, li- if you listen to Mary's first, the first carol, the first Christmas song, you'd be like, whoa, we've drifted some, right? Because it has nothing to do uh, with what Christmas is actually about. The first Christmas song is what we'll be looking at uh, this, this morning. Um, I'm going to read verses 26 to 38 as we orient to the rejoicing that Mary ends up singing uh, as the first, the first song. It says this, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give you the throne of his father, David, and will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And in the sixth month with her, uh, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed uh, from her. So the first section I wanted to to kind of parse out this way into this subheading is uh, Mary clearly had a divine appointment. Gabriel, an angel from God, came to Mary and gave her this divine appointment, gave her a divine message. A special message, the special message of Christmas, Christmas, that you will conceive a son. And it will be of, 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 uh, it would be of the Spirit of God, and the Son that will be born is the, the Son of the Most High. It will be God's Son. This is supernatural. This is a divine message, a divine appointment. This is incredible. This is why we celebrate Christmas. We believe that God became man and dwelt among us, and it came through a virgin uh, getting pregnant by God and, and giving birth to, to, like I said, Emmanuel, God with us. This is why we, we celebrate. It's it's pretty out there. Can I, I mean, can I just say that? Like, this doesn't, this doesn't normally happen, but this is the word of God, and it's supernatural, and this is the message of Christmas. Came from God, a divine appointment, divine message. Now, I just want to have a little side note and talk for a second, is what, what qualified, what qualified Mary to carry God's own, own son? It's a good question, I think, to ponder. Like, wh- wh- why did God look at Mary of all people and say, like, you know what, She's the one that's going to experience carrying uh, uh, my own son and uh, carry the Savior of the world. Now, I think a lot of people get this confused because I think we have to answer this question. It's because I think a lot of people, God looked at Mary and said, she saw something different or special or even admirable. And I'm not going to shame Mary's character because I, I didn't know her. But I don't think that's what it is at all. And I think a lot of times God looks at, we believe that God looks at the people and he's looking for the good people, the notable people, that so, something that makes them stand out to bless them. And this is not according to scripture. I don't believe Mary was noble. So we, a lot of us think like maybe she was noble, she was good. Maybe she was a more moral person than the other young girls running around. Maybe she was more prominent. Maybe she was really smart or beautiful. She was really good. And, and what you find here in the text, again, I'm not going to marginalize uh, her character. I, I didn't know her. But what I can say is God looked on her lowest state. She was, she was young. So, you know, in our, in our culture, we, we overemphasize youth. That, that was not the case in that culture. If you were young, you were marginalized. You didn't know. You didn't have wisdom. She was a young lady. L- women were not uh, valued as they are today. They'd be more the marginalized, the low estate 
in, in that culture. She was not, she was not married. Uh, she was very poor as she sacrificed. Uh, as she found out she was having, uh, she gave birth to a son, she sacrificed two turtle doves. Uh, and, and so the idea is like, she had nothing. She had nothing. That's what qualified her before God. She, she actually understood she was very lowly. It's so interesting as in verse 28, when this message came down, it says, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. The, the, the idea here is not that she is favored because something she did. She's favored because who God is. What's, what's being said here is you have found favor with God, which is actually the next few verses, is because God has, has graced you. God makes her special. It's God's grace that sets her apart. Even further, the emphasize this is true, as God says, oh, oh, favored one, she's like, who, me? You talking to me? It's like, it's like when you're walking in a room, you see someone waving, you're like, you, wave, you waving at me? Like, at me? This is the, the response that she's having. Like, she's confused and trying to discern the saying, because she can't believe, like, why in the world would God be picking me? I am a nobody, I have nothing. I'm of low estate. He's like, exactly. I'm somebody, I'm the one who <clears throat> will set you apart. Now, um, this, is not, this is not abnormal just in this story. This is the story of the entire Bible. It's the story of Christmas. This is why I'm emphasizing it. If you remember, as we were in our Genesis, Genesis series, we always think Noah is very different and amazing. He must have been a great person. God saved him from the flood. What it says here in Genesis 6, 5, uh, it'll be up on the screen, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <clears throat> this means that everyone on the face of the earth was always, always sinning. At, at their motivation, heart level, it was continually sin, uh, sinning. This included Noah. This included every person that's ever been born after Adam and Eve Furthermore, in Genesis 6, 8, what set Noah apart? But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then it says Noah was righteous. So what was different between Noah than all the rest of all sinful humanity? Nothing. It's simply that he found favor with God. It's God that sets us apart. It's God that makes us different. And so that, that's the first thing that we'll come back to at the very end as, as God came for the least of these, the humble estate. The qualification, the qualification to receive Christmas is you got to understand you have nothing. The problem with that is <laughs> we think we're pretty great. That, that we're actually the problem. We think we have a lot. So you can't receive a, a gift with your hands full. And the problem is we're very full of ourselves. And that we'll get to that more in a second. So again, a divine appointment happened. God, in a supernatural way, came to Mary through uh, Gabriel, who's just a messenger, he's speaking on behalf of God, this special, special message to her. Now, God still speaks. God still speaks. That, that's, I want you to think about this. God wants you to have divine appointments. He's still speaking to you. He speaks through his word. Like a preacher is a messenger. As you open the word of God, God speaks to you. He can speak to you through a song. He can, th he can speak uh, to you through epiphanies. Maybe it's a men's or women's conference. Maybe it's a Bible study. Maybe it's a thought that God lays on your heart. I want you to hear that God still speaks. My question is, are you listening to what God is saying to you? Are you listening? So I am unlike and like Mary. You can take that for what it's worth. God speaks to me. When I'm in the word of God, he speaks to me. As the door church is planted, it came supernaturally through a dream. It came through a dream. I was graduating seminary. My wife was pregnant. And I was praying with, to, God with, to, to God with my wife, uh, you know, in the evening. I said, God, what do you want me to do? I am yours. You, you want me to go in the business world? I'm in. If you want me to, to plant a church, I'm in. You want me to be a pastor? I'm in. Whatever you want, I, God, my yes is on the table. And, and, and I was open to anything. And that night, I was praying with Marcy. God, just be clear what you want us to do. And that night, he laid two words on my brain, the door, the door, the door, the door, all night. Woke up, felt like, man, what in the world was that? I don't know what the door means. God, you got to be more clear than that. I felt like I was wrestling with sheets, thought it was something bad that I ate. Now, 
what happened next is I have a reading plan where I allow God to speak to me in the mornings. It's a McShane reading plan. I was in John chapter 10. <laughs> you know, by God's sovereign providence. If you know John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door to eternal life. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Go in and, and, and find pasture. It scared me to death. I just had a dream about the door all night, got in my Bible, John 10, Jesus says, I'm the door. And I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do here, God. And I didn't tell anyone for at least three days. Because if I felt like I had told my wife, she's like, one, you're crazy. Number two, I felt like, man, if it's the door, planning a church, I mean, I didn't, know if, I didn't know if I was in on that. I was gonna be honest with you. I was like, you know what? I said I was in, I'm not sure if I'm in. Um, and so I had to process through that. Some things that were going in my mind as God spoke to me very clearly uh, is, is who am I? Same thing Mary did, who am I? The problem here is I know who I am. That, that was the problem. When you say, who am I? The problem is actually me. I know who I am. I say that kind of funnily, or at least um, with a smile on my face, because I can look at people in here, they know who I am. Like, I have my cousins in here. I got Bard in here. They like, you wanna go know him? They'll tell you who I am. Not only do I know who I am, they know who I am, God. This is gonna be a problem. Right, I got some issues. Um, furthermore, not only did I have some questions of, of, of my own character, what are people gonna think? I mean, Mary had to be thinking, you know what, this seems a little odd, right? A virgin getting pregnant. How's this going to work? That's what she asked. How's this going to work? That's what, I asked that question to God. How in the world am I going to be a, a church planner? How am I gonna start? I can't preach, I don't even speak well. I don't like speaking in front of people, God. Believe it or not, you may be like, I know this. I mean, if you've seen a text, for, text message from me, like that's legit. Like I read it over, you're like, man, did he read it over? I did, and it still comes out that way. Like that's how bad the communication is. It wasn't like the iPhone put something else in, that's it. I'm gonna tell you something else, all cards on the table, scored an 820 on my SAT, very embarrassing. Know why? I fell asleep, I was such a train wreck. My dad's like, what happened? I was like, well, I, I don't really know what happened. <laughs> they woke me up and I walked out. That's what happened. <laughs> like, I am not the sharpest tool in the shed. I have lots of issues. And this is where I'm at. Now, what I want you to hear is God speaks to us. He wants to use you. And he has a purpose in your life. Mary's not that abnormal. She's, she carried Jesus, so she is. But God still speaks and he uses messengers, and the questions, are you listening? Now, I want you to hear something. As God has a divine appointment, a divine message for you, it's not like God told me and I do whatever I want. That's not what happened. It should, first thing, it should scare you, it should humble you. If you're like, yeah, God, you, I've been waiting for you to call on me, probably not, you're probably not hearing right, because you're full of yourself. Number two, it is always confirmed with the word of God. God's not calling you to do something that is not confirmed in the word of God. It is actually here in this text, it says this in 2 Samuel 17, 16, and 17. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision Nathan spoke to David. This is the same wording here in verses 32 to 33. So he actually... The, the prof, uh, angel actually gives her scripture to confirm this calling. This is in line with the word of God. It's always... Uh, in line with the word of God. Now, furthermore, not only did God speak, it should be confirmed in the word of God if God gives you a clear message. Uh, also, he gives her a tidbit. Go see your cousin Elizabeth, who is barren. Why? Because she's old and supernatural. Nothing supernatural. Nothing is impossible with God to go see. She's also pregnant. So she, she, uh, the angel gives uh, Mary a tidbit. Go see your cousin. Why? Because she's also pregnant, you will see this is true. And you're not crazy, I'm speaking to you. Now, here's what's interesting. You don't see Mary just rejoicing in song at this point. She hears a divine message, she's, she's trying to figure out what's going on, how's this going to be. God says to go see Elizabeth, her cousin, and she just puts her yes on the table. I wouldn't say, I, I would say it's a reluctant yes. It was a yes, it's obedient yes, it's walking by faith, but there's no rejoicing at this point. I can tell you when God spoke to me, it wasn't like, oh, I'm super excited about this. I was like, I'm scared. I'm not sure how this is gonna work. And it's a reluctant yes. It says this in verse 38, Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. He's it's like, let it be. I'm a servant, I'm your bond servant, I'm yours. 
I don't know how it's gonna go, but let it be. It's, it's like when I text message someone and, and then I say, hey, you wanna go do something? They're like, sure. Like, that's like the, the, the language of response. Like, I, I guess I'm in, okay, right? This is the response that she, she's, she has and she departed to go see Elizabeth. So this is a divine appointment. Now, I'm gonna mention something. I gotta go pretty quickly. This is probably not what Mary had for her life. That's just a side note. When God has a divine appointment for you, it's probably not what you were thinking. Like she was, she was betrothed, she was gonna get married, this was not on her plan. So this, this is a, not only a divine appointment, a divine calling, it was a divine interruption. She had, her, she had her life going a different direction. God usually calls us into a different direction and that's why she's like, man, I'll put my yes on the table but I don't know how that's gonna work out. That's not, that wasn't my plan. Now, I wanna look at 39 through 45. Clarity comes in biblical community. So the angel not only gave her a divine message, But he said, go check with Elizabeth. And as she goes to Elizabeth, listen to what it says in verses 39 through 45. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, or leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is the one who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So I'm going to give you a little side note, then we're going to get into the text. What you have here, it's, it's super beautiful, is the Trinity is, that, uh, is presented here. God sends Gabriel, angel, to Mary. God the Father said, hey, you're going to have a son. What we see is God, uh, uh, the Son of God, come into Mary, and Mary is now carrying the Son of God by the Spirit of God. She goes and, she goes and sees her, her cousin Elizabeth, and the Holy Spirit comes in and gives insight to who Christ is. You see the Trinity at work here in this text, which is beautiful, which is the, the, the salvation is an act of a triune God. And, and that's just, just a side note. But as Mary hears this message, she's confused. She puts her reluctant yes on the table. She goes and visit, it, visit her, her cousin Elizabeth. And what I'm gonna say is, if you hear a calling from God, it's always confirmed in scripture number two, it's confirmed in biblical community. It says this in Proverbs 1, 5, let the wise hear and increase in learning and the one who understands obtain guidance. We need to submit ourselves to other people and learn from them. If they are Christ followers, and Elizabeth was a, a God-fearer, she was wife of, of, of Zechariah, a priest, and so, man, she was fearing God. She's submitting herself by going to visit. Hey, what do you see here? Proverbs twelve fifteen says it this way, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. If it's just you and God, you're gonna do what you want, you're probably not hearing from God. You should one, confirm in scripture, then submit yourself to other people. But a wise man listens to advice. And so you see Mary, man, following the word of God, saying, I'm gonna go visit Elizabeth. I'm gonna confirm this calling. She's submitting there. And what happens here? What happens here is she experiences the confirmation of community. What's so interesting is that every single week, whoever's preaching up here is going to try to present the clarity and the glories of Jesus Christ. Because that's what we need every single week. That's what men do. That's what teachers are trying to present Christ, but only the Spirit of God can reveal, reveal the Son in us. So we're trying to present it to you, but only the Spirit of God can present it to us. Like you may be hearing, but when you start, when the Spirit of God comes and you're beholding, it gives you sight. And this is what happens to Elizabeth. Mary comes, she is carrying the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Elizabeth is overcome by the Spirit of God that gives insight, sight to who Jesus is. It says, this is the mother of my Lord. So you're carrying, you're carrying my Lord in your womb. Now, what's interesting, as the Spirit of God gives insight to Elizabeth, say, that is the Christ. That's the Messiah. You know what happens as a believer gives sight is, 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 is Mary sees it as well. She starts to actually see it for the first time. One, Elizabeth is pregnant, which confirms the word of God. Number two, without her even presenting, it's like, you're carrying the Lord. And this, this calling is confirmed. What's interesting is you go to community and you process your calling and what God's doing in your life. It brings clarity and it brings confidence that you can start to walk by faith because you're not crazy, but you're called by God. And when you're called by God, man, you can, you can be confident in the Lord. Now, as God called me to plant, I one confirmed it in the scripture. I've 
Finally told my wife, and she was like, ah, I don't know, Scott. Um, so I so wasn't confirmed. I called my, 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 um, my mentor, Mike Fetcher, and he walked with me for years. And um, he was a great man of God, discipled me. And I said, hey, Mike, I feel like God's calling me this. He's like, you know what's interesting, Scott? He's like, I've known that for years. He's like, I've been praying for when God is going to reveal it to you. Man, talk about, man, confidence in your calling. He's like, man, this guy has seen it for years. And it gave me courage to walk by faith. Now, what's so interesting is uh, in December 8, 2009, I'm not a big ex Twitter, whatever. I don't write much on it. Evidently, in December 8, 2009, I felt a word to, to say. It said this, because I was not in ministry, felt confirmed in my calling. Mike had spoken this, this confidence over me. Uh, I was working for my father, who's an insurance salesman. It says, working for my father on enrollment for employee benefits. Glad that God has called me into full-time ministry. 2009. I had nothing going for me besides a calling of God. Now, and I was just, I'm shocked. 14 years later, this is where we're at. It's incredible. And, and it, it, it's only what God's done, but that's what happens Man, when you have confidence in your calling, see that community brings clarity, brings confidence. And let me tell you, it hasn't been easy. I'm not saying Mary walked easy road. I'm not saying you're gonna walk an easy road, but God is faithful is what I'm telling you. And it's worth it. And it's amazing to see what God can do as you just follow him and you walk by faith. Now, as this happens, as this hap happens, now Mary will magnify the Lord. She starts to walk in this faithful obedience. She's discerning the will of God through the word of God, the calling of God in community. And as Elizabeth sees, sees the clarity of Christ in the carnal life, she sees it. And what happens? She magnifies the Lord. There's finally joy. So joy doesn't always come right away. It comes through faithful obedience and the joy as she sees it, man, she rejoices. Now, 46 to 48 in Mary's song, she's magnifying the Lord. Is, is really about her. Then 49 through 56 is about him and really the gospel message of Christmas. This is, this is what Christmas songs should be about, is Christ. It says this in verse 46 to 48. is about her. And Mary said, my soul was it magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in, my, in God, my Savior, for he has looked <clears throat> on the humble estate, her servant, for behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. There's two things I want you to see here. And then we'll move on to the next one. Is one is that she is calling the baby in her in her womb my savior. She had recognized she is a sinful person of low estate who needs a savior, and she's rejoicing in my in her God, who has saved her, and on, on the and a soul level. Why? Because God is is going to redeem even Mary, and so she finds rejoicing in the salvation that she's going to experience. Number two, <clears throat> listen to this. It says. For behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. She is rejoicing, one, that God loves her, a nobody. A nobody. Because God, God says she's a somebody, she is, and she's rejoicing in that. And she says, all generations will call me blessed. You know what's crazy is we're talking about Mary. Again, low estate, no, one, no one's really, she's not special. God made her special, but she has a special calling and she walked by faith. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. We're facing always two deaths. I want you to hear that. You're fighting a losing battle right now. One day you're gonna breathe out your last breath and you will be dead. That's the reality of life. The good news is Jesus defeated death. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection of life. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but live forever. That's why she is magnifying the world. This is the offer of Christmas. You're not going to die, but you're going to be raised if you have faith in Christ. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy what I just said. I mean, praise God for that. Number two, not only are you going to give out your last breath, there'll be a day in time that someone, the two deaths occur is not only when you die, but also the, the last time that someone mentions your name. The, the memory of you fades from this earth forever. There will be a time that no one's going to remember you. And what she's saying, all generations will call me blessed, that she's saying, I will not be forgotten. Why? Because God remembers her. I'm going to tell you something. Everything in your life is you're kind of battling not only do you're dying, but also your legacy. No one's going to remember you. The truth of the matter, it's right. You know what? No one's going to remember Tom Brady 500,000 years from now. Just no, no one's going to, no one, probably U.S. won't be here. Don't, I don't know that. That's not a prophecy. But like the point is some other sport's probably going to come along. No one's going to remember his name. But if you're in Christ, man, your name will be remembered. It will. 
and your legacy will carry on. And what I'm gonna tell you is what you do with your life matters. Not about achievement, about possessions, about what you accomplish, about what, trusting what Christ has done and leading other people to do that. You can have a generational blessing on your family by how you lead them. And they will remember your name because God will remember your name. Whatever is done for Christ will last. Everything else will not. I'm not marginalizing anything in your life. I'm trying to get you a central and clarity of what matters most. How are you using your life? What are you investing in? Because these relationships in Christ are eternal and will last forever. Everything else will be forgotten. 49 through 56 is the message of Christmas. I'll read it. It's super interesting, 49 through, uh, through 56. For he, who is, uh, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and, is holy, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. <clears throat> he has helped his servant Israel in the remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to the fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her, her home. Now, what I want you to see here is 51, 52, and 53, and we'll close, uh, let's see here, on 52. This is, this is the message of Christmas. Listen, I want you to listen. God become man dwelling among us. Him being a redeemer, a savior. Listen, he says, it scatters the thoughts of the proud. Verse 52, he has brought down the rulers from their throne. 53, he has sent away the rich, the rich empty. This is, this is the message of Christmas. Most of us in church think, think the church is a bunch of good people. It's the people that have really good thoughts, wise thoughts. We're wiser than the world. We're decent people. We're people of position, the wise ones, the high ones, the rich ones, the moral ones, the people with good resume. <clears throat> what does it say that God does with these self-righteous people? Scatters the thoughts of the proud. He has brought down the rulers of their throne. He has sent away the rich empty. This is not the way of Christ. It's not the way of Christmas. This is not Christianity. He's not looking for the good people. There are none. He's looking for the O's of humble, the humble estate. The real, the, those who realize they have nothing, those are the ones that can actually receive Christmas, just as Mary. It's the sinners, the sufferers, the prostitutes, the pimp. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Listen to me. There are no VIPs here. There's only six sinners. And if that's not your confession, you don't, know, you don't know the message of Christmas. No VIPs. It's the lowliest state. It's the people that, that, that not only have nothing, because that's actually all of us, but those who can confess it. Those are the ones that receive Christ. <clears throat> if I could put on a coffee cup and give it to everyone, it would be Chris, really Christmas and Christians are the who's who's of who's nots. That, that, that's, that's Christmas. Is that your confession? Is that your hope? See, all we... All we Christmas is a gift of grace to the needy in the lowest state. The question is, will you humble yourself and confess that your state and receive the riches and glories of which is Jesus Christ? He came to give it to you. Let's pray. God, I pray that you'd help us realize that you scatter the thoughts of the proud, that you bring down the rulers of thrones, that you send away the rich empty. God, help us confess that we are nobodies. But as we confess that we're nobodies, we'll meet the one somebody, which is Jesus Christ, and we'll find mercy forevermore, life forevermore. God, that we would rejoice in our humble estate because you've looked on us and raised us up in Jesus Christ. It's you that make us great. God, I pray that we'd understand that in Christ we have found favor with you. We're righteous before you. I pray as we sing it, the Spirit of God will allow us to have insight to the glories of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I pray that others would consider not only the love of Jesus Christ, but what they're doing with their life. How is God speaking to them? How they're using their time, their talents, and their treasures? How, how they will be using their life to spread the gospel, this message of love, of redemption, of life, that other generations, generations in their family line would call them blessed because of the treasure that they promoted, which is Jesus. Help us not waste our life. I ask that in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.